Welcome to our webinar today, How to Buy the Right Business, by Scott Bushke of Cornerstone Business Services. My name is Ryan Kauf, and I will be your host today. I direct the Wisconsin Small Business Development Center, or SBDC, at UW-Green Bay. The Wisconsin Small Business Development Center at UW-Green Bay is part of a statewide network supporting entrepreneurs and business owners through no-cost, confidential business advising and targeted educational programs. Regional SBDC experts facilitate improvement and growth for small and emerging mid-sized companies and help launch successful new enterprises. The no-cost business counseling and low-cost leadership development training at the Wisconsin SBDC at UW-Green Bay is funded in part through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Small Business Administration, or SBA. Our website is uwgb.edu slash sbdc. We call these monthly no-cost 30-minute webinars our Secrets to Success series, designed to help small business owners and their executive team members increase their financial success. At the conclusion of this webinar, we will share the upcoming webinar topics, and we encourage you to consider registering for those. We thank Mickey and Tim from First Business Bank and Michael Wentworth of TMR Associates for their partnership in developing and promoting these monthly webinars and for their dedication to small business success. And there's Michael Wentworth there. After the webinar, you will be emailed a link to a recording of this webinar. Also, during the webinar, you are invited to ask questions at any time. Please use the menu along the right side of your screen indicated here in the red circle Type your question in there and hit enter. As soon as I see it, I will make note of it for the presenter to address toward the end of our webinar. And now I'd like to turn it over to our expert presenter this month, Scott Bushke of Cornerstone Business Services. Scott? Thank you, Ryan. All right, I get my screen up here. Can you see my screen? You're good to go, Scott. All right, thank you. Yep. All right, uh, yes. What I'd like to cover today uh, is why buy, you know, versus start a business, and and also how to buy the right business, and some of the pitfalls uh, that come along with uh, buying a business. So, you know, I've been doing this for 16 years. I've been on both the buy side and the sell side, and we've seen, you know, definitely different things that uh, you know work better than others, and other tactics that some buyers use to really make sure that they're buying the right company and getting a good value. So, I'm going to take off my sell side hat, advisory. Uh, here for a while and, and really give you some different ideas of how to make sure you're, you're, you're making the right acquisition or have the best chances of success on the buy side. Uh, starting out first is, you know, why buy versus start a business? And I'll touch a little bit on this from an individual but also, you know, from a company standpoint. Uh, the first one is, is the proven model. A lot of it goes back to risk versus reward, but by buying a business, you understand that this is a, this is a model that, that works, that's proven. You might have the best idea in the world. Your friends and family might think you have a great idea, but you take it out to market and nobody's interested, uh, nobody cares, or there's a you know you find out there's a better solution out there. So with, with buying a business, you know that you've got a proven model that makes sense at the end of the day. Along with with some of these are the infrastructure in place. Uh, just finding the location. You know where should you be? Will that location work or not? All the time and energy going into finding the right location, whether it's uh, you know, retail, industrial, manufacturing, whatever it may be, uh, the different supplier relationships uh, are, again, already in place. Who are you going to buy your products and services from? What, what are the costs going to be? What's already been negotiated? Uh, the operating processes, you know, how are, what are all the details that are going to help you operate your business as successfully as possible? Uh, the trained employees, you know, I just hired a new executive assistant uh, last week. And I probably spent four to six weeks, you know, going through different uh, resumes and interviewing people and, and trying to get those people. And now I gotta spend the next three to six months, you know, getting her up to speed to get trained. You know, those people are already all trained. You know, they they've been hired, they've learned, and they're there to work for the company and, and hopefully bring you know some value to the company. And then lastly, on this slide is the brand. You know, it, it's a brand that hopefully you're looking at that's recognizable. Has has built up some uh, some trust with some with the customer base and, and is out there and, and uh, is something that will help you gain more traction as you go forward versus a new idea just starting up and having to uh, you know really create that traction which can take uh, you know sometimes uh, weeks or, or months. 
uh, if you buy a business versus starting one, you've got that existing customer base uh, already started, as, as we talked before. Uh, you know, depending on what type of an industry and how successful you are or aren't, if you're starting one in the beginning, it could be, you know, sometimes months, if not years, before you really get, you know, some really good traction that you're uh, hitting some numbers that you think make sense or, or be able to pull a salary and things along that line. And then the immediate cash flow. Uh, yes, you're going to pay more up front, but with buying a business, you're going to make sure that that business cash flow can support that support that debt and, and those payments on top of that, plus also leaving some money for a reinvestment back into the business or a return to you as, as the owner of the business. So, uh, you know, you're paying more up front, but on the flip side, you know, the cash flow will be there. And also with buying a business versus starting one, you've got a few more people that are there to uh, make sure you're doing the right thing because, you know, if most times people use a lender to get uh, to buy a business. Not, sometimes they do on starting one up, but other times not. <clears throat> Excuse me. And by you working with a lender or other professionals, they're really going to scrutinize those cash flows, probably even sometimes more than you will, uh, to make sure that the cash flows are there to support that debt service because they don't want to see you fail or have their loan uh, go bad. Uh, on the flip side, if you're starting a business, again, sometimes people tell you it's exciting. They tell you what you want to hear. You can spend a lot of your own money and a lot of your own time. And I've seen people that have started up businesses versus buying one that uh, – it took them two or three years before they could take any kind of a reasonable salary. So, again, you, you just have to weigh the, the pros and the cons. There's pros and cons with each. And a lot of it comes down to just that, that risk versus reward. And also what business, you know, what business you want to be in. Are there opportunities for that business out there? What's your experience levels? You know, if you look at the, the riskiest business, it's probably one that if you start up a business, in which you have little or no experience or any kind of a network. So you just think you've got a good idea, but it hasn't been proven at any level by you specifically. Uh, you, you just think there's a, something out there to solve. And the safest probably would be to buy an existing franchisee's business. So not even just to buy a franchise from a franchisor, but an existing franchise that you've got the owner that's proven that it works in you know, a Green Bay, Wisconsin, whatever that may be for that business. And also when they stay on, you know, they'll typically stay as a consultant for some period of time, but even when they walk away, you've got that franchisor is that safety, uh, that safety blanket. So again, there's more fees up front to buy the business, and with a franchise, there's typically ongoing fees. But if you're looking at just risk and reward and what's the safest, that would definitely be the, the safest versus starting one from scratch. So moving on in, into a little bit more of the details that I want to cover is really what are the characteristics to look for in a company or what are some questions that you should be asking the business owner uh, when, when you're looking at buying a specific company. And the first one is, is what's the owner's role? You know, how critical are he or she to the business? Uh, how, you know, what, what's their role? What do they do on a day-to-day -day level? I've had some people tell me, you know, that even if it's a $20 million revenue company, that you know, they have all, they're working, you know, night and day, seven days a week. They've got uh, all the key customer relationships are, are with them, and they make all the decisions. And that's great for your ego if you want to make sure that, you know, you're the guy that runs this business and everybody knows it. But from a sales standpoint, that's really not a company that you want to buy because the, if that person decides not to stay on after the sale or gets hit by a bus, you know, the proverbial bus, you know, what did you buy? You've got a lot at risk uh, in that, which we'll see in several other more detailed slides to follow. Uh, one key question that a lot of times I ask uh, if I'm on the buy side is get into talking about vacations and maybe the last vacation you took and get into talking to them about what's the last vacation that, that they took and how long ago was it? You know, maybe the last two. You know, do they take, you know, one or two vacations a week long, uh, a year? Have they not taken a vacation for five years? Um, do they take six months off and uh, live in Florida or Arizona for you know for the six months in, in, in a snowbird and have people that run it while they're gone? Obviously, the ideal if you're buying a company is is a person that can take off six months or has completely worked themselves out of the business and doesn't even isn't even there on the day to day levels uh, of of the business and has put the management team in place to to run the company and it's proven that it works, you know, the flip side of that, I kind of got my red light, green light of what would be good and what would be, be bad or maybe, you know, raise a red flag would be 
you know, if they haven't taken a vacation in five years and they look like they're extremely burnt out, um, you know, that, that's something that you just want to take a look at. Again, none of these red flags or red lights individually in themselves is it saying that that's a deal you should do. It's just, you know, you want to see how some of these things play out and, and then balance the, the pros and the cons at the end of uh, your due diligence. Uh, next is the process. You know, do they have processes in place? Are they proprietary processes or are they pretty much just a commodity? Uh, and then again, from the, the negative standpoint, a lot of times, that, and again, it doesn't make a difference how big the company is, if the processes are inside that owner's head, uh, even if they decide to stay on, again, they could lose interest very quickly after they get that check or something could happen to them or, you know, whatever else it might be. Is it, if they're not, you know, if they are all in that head, you know, even in your due diligence, part of going to close would be a contingent that they write that process down and, and you know, you, they te talk you through it and walk you through it to help you understand it. They're probably not going to do that up front, but at the end of the deal, before you sign and, and give them a check, I would try to get something down on paper if at all possible. And then, obviously, the, 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 the ideal company, that if you're looking at one that does definitely have a proprietary process, and uh, it is recorded in, in a manual online, and several employees have this knowledge. That way, if the owner does go away or something would happen to him or her, uh, kind of that secret sauce that you bought is, is, still, part of, uh, is still part of that deal in, in moving forward. Customer relationships, uh, again, another one that we see uh, on companies that we're working with, a $160 million company right now, and he's got a sales team, but he really likes to do sales, so the top two relationships are with his company, or are with the owner, and that's going to hurt him when it comes to selling because he's going to have to stick around a little bit more. They might ask him to do a little bit more seller financing because he has those key relationships with, with, the, with the two largest customers of his. So, you know, where are those key relationships and, you know, what, what can you do to, uh, to make sure that those transfer over? Uh, you know, are they with multiple employees who remain with the sale? You know, do they have salespeople or are they, you know, only with the owner? Again, something that you want to find out, not just what's the customer concentration, but who has those relationships and for how long. You know, they might have just changed, you know, the owner might have just changed that over two months ago. Well, you're going to want the owner to spend, you know, some more time after the sale. Typically, we'll see owners, depending on the size of the deal and what their role is, is you know, six months to a year on the short side. Uh, and, and as long as three to five years on, on the on the long side, depending on that. And one thing that you can do here too, that a little tip that I've seen uh, buyers use is when you you do get and it's usually towards the end of the due diligence process, but you actually hire a marketing research firm. Uh, you pay for it as the buyer, but it's under the disguise of of the company paying for it and, and doing the research. But you might call the top ten customers. Or they, they would the marketing research firm would call the top ten customers and say, Hey, just call in on behalf of Cornerstone Business Services and they just want to see, you know, what we're doing well, what we're not doing well, you know, what we can do better, uh, how's the relationship, you know, what what do you think your sales are going to be for next year? So it, it looks to the buyer or or to the uh, the customer as, boy, these guys care about us, they're trying to look, you know, always become a better partner and just trying to understand what they do well and what they can do better. But from a buyer standpoint, you can really learn who has that relationship, how strong is the relationship, what do they expect going into the future, are there things that you can improve upon. And it's really a nice tool to really solidify uh, where those relationships are with, with, you know, with those top customers. They're probably not going to call them all, but a lot of times I've seen them call the top, the top 10 or, or so, plus or minus from that, uh, from that number. But that, that definitely can uh, bring out a lot of... Uh, any skeletons in the closets or any customers that are about to leave or, or you know, a salesperson just left and you don't find out about it, it really does uncover a lot of, of potential issues that could hurt you going forward. Going forward. Trends, uh, you know, underst understanding, uh, you know, what the trends of the company are. Obviously, if you're buying a company, you don't want that industry trend to be negative uh, or even worse yet is kind of a yo-yo uh, where they're, up, you know, one year and making money, the next year they lose money, and 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 then back and forth because it's, obviously it's very hard to budget for that on a go forward basis. So uh, you want to look for a company that not only is, is steady and growing, but has a lot of runway or a lot of opportunity left out there uh, in an ideal world. So 
uh, not only just the trends of the company in their industry, but looking at those customers and what end markets are they in and what are the trends of those end markets. So you, you want to peel that onion back, you know, a couple layers on, on industry trends and, and what the customers are doing and how, you know, how solid they are financially and also, uh, you know, their industries per se. You know, what does the core competency or the competition look like? Um, this is one that uh, is interesting. You know, you really don't want in most cases, again, every, there's always exceptions to the rule, but, you know, what I've seen out there is if you're buying a company and they have very little market share and they basically only compete on price and the margins are very thin, uh, that could be really tough business to keep after the sale or uh, it just usually doesn't work out as well versus a company that, you know, is a market leader or one of the market leaders and has some kind of a unique value add that isn't just price driven, uh, that's difficult to compete against. You know, looking at a fragmented market place is always nice. Uh, and, and then also obviously margins. So if, as, as you grow that business, you know, at the end of the day, how much money can you drive to the bottom line? I've seen many companies, you know, I've seen a $50 million company, <clears throat> you know, losing $2 million and I've seen a $5 million company make $2 million. So, uh, you know, sales bigger is not always better. It's really looking at, you know, what are those margins and why why are those companies uh, doing business with, uh, you know, with each other. And, and I'll get into that a little bit more under some of the uh, uh, mistakes that uh, that we see making out there. Also here you might want to talk, you know, talk to the trade association directors if they're part of an association and see how they're perceived in the industry. Are they thought of as a thought leader? Uh, have they been active? Uh, are they ahead of the game or, or are they just you know one of the followers in the back of the pack? Reoccurring revenue versus transition transactional revenue. Uh, this is one that uh, you know if it's transactional and there's longer sales cycle, uh, you're never going to sell to the customer twice versus one that's reoccurring revenue each and every month you know, all revenue is the same, you're going to pay much more, or most times more buyers are going to pay much more for that reoccurring revenue. So, you, you know, you want to find companies out there that, again, it goes somewhat to budgeting, but also on how, how easily can you grow this company. And, you know, on the ideal side of things, you know, you want to be able to get that reoccurring clients. Obviously, the ideal would be somewhere where they sign up for some kind of a monthly fee and, you know, it, it, it's ongoing or evergreen until they, until they cancel it for some reason. Uh, or you've got a multi-year written contract uh, with no early out provisions. Uh, those are tough to get these days, but you know they are, are are available in some of the industries. Or you know there's one with a, a larger sunken cost up front, and then small, smaller ongoing orders or fees along the line after that first investment. You know think of kind of the buying the razor and then the razor blade. You know the razor blade doesn't cost that much to you know you, you buy that, but you know you buy the razor blade, but then you get you know the excuse me, you buy the razor and then you get the razor blade and you got those ongoing costs and obviously they, they really mark up the, those blades and that's where the margins are. Also, you know, if you think about it from a, a cable provider standpoint, uh, you know, you, you lock in for typically a year, but most times you can break the contract or at, the, at least at the end of each year you can jump back and forth between Time Warner or AT&T or whatever it may be. But, you know, if, if you could find a company that you know, maybe AT&T came out with some great technology and good enough for someone to invest $500 or $1,000 up front to be able to get this technology. Now, you know, now you're not going to switch to as easy to, you know, Time Warner for, a, you know, a $10 a month savings because you've got that $1,000 investment. So, again, not all revenue is the same. So looking at, you know, how much of it is reoccurring or at least repeat customers, uh, even if it's not, just a monthly fee or anything like that uh, that you're getting, whether it's you know, a large manufacturing company with repeat orders on, on a consistent basis, or even if it's a small restaurant and having the same people, you know, come in, you know, for happy hour every Friday or Thursday, whatever it might uh, it might be. Uh, needed for working capital. And this one can somewhat cut both ways. Uh, you know, the more that you need for you know, the more capex that you need, if, if it's a large component of the ongoing operation. It's tough to put profits back in your pocket or, or in the shareholders' pockets at the end of the day. So even though you know you're, you're growing and you're making more money, a lot of times uh, that just requires more you know more capex. I've got a client right now that we're working with out in the oil and gas region out in the Bakken in North Dakota, and 
you know, he's he continues to grow. He's doing about twenty million right now, but he's got six million dollars sitting in the accounts receivable. So he's got a lot of money tied up uh, in the company. He's got a lot of investments in the in the big machinery, uh, moving the earth around, and all, all these different things that. Uh, He's like, yeah, I, I, the company's making a lot of money, but he hasn't been able to pull out much of himself. So he's just continued to reinvest back in the company to, you know, grow the company a little bit, but also just to maintain the the equipment, you know, the expensive equipment that they have there. Um, you know, on the flip side, you know, there's companies that you don't need to invest as much. Maybe they have some kind of a proprietary process, and you know, you, you're ahead of the curve as a thought leader, so you don't have to spend as much on large manufacturing equipment or, or large construction equipment uh, so you can put more in your back pocket. Uh, the flip side on that would be, you know, from a barrier entry standpoint, uh, you, you know, if someone comes out with similar technology, it may be able, a little bit easier to compete with a service company uh, than it would a large manufacturing company who's invested in, you know, $15 million worth of uh, assets. It, you know, it, it takes a while to build that up and as you continue to grow, you can you, you build a little bit more of a competitive advantage, but it definitely will affect what your you know what the bottom line of the company is. Uh, customer concentration, another another big item. You know we call it the you know somewhat the Walmart effect. You know I've seen business owners that have told me, boy, you know I'm growing. I'm gone from five to fifteen to twenty to twenty five million in sales, and that's great. What they don't tell me is that. You know they've grown with one big customer that started off as 15 percent of their business and now it's 85 percent of the business. Um, you know you really want to find someone. I've seen it where most buyers are okay with something under 15 percent uh, is is one customer. Once you get over 15, some say 20 percent, then you're gonna you know you probably want to affect you know lower the value of the business a little bit or definitely look at structuring the company possibly a little bit different with tying tying that to an earn out or some seller financing or some kind of contingent that protects you as a buyer that if that company leaves, that buyer or that client leaves, that you're not gonna, you know, you're not paying for that all up front. Uh, so structure is important here, but you can sell, you know, I we just sold a company in North Dakota that was he told me he had a little bit of customer concentration. When I looked at his numbers, I called him back and it was ninety seven point seven percent with one customer. I said, you know, you just you don't have customer concentration, you only have one customer, um, but we were still able to sell that uh, sell that uh, client to a, a much larger company that had a thousand employees, and they they had you know six of the big oil and gas companies out there, but they didn't have this one, so now they had seven, and they structured it in a way where they basically they paid for the assets up front, and then over two years they were going to pay for the you know kind of the goodwill or the blue sky uh, as long as that you know, as long as that customer stayed, and, and uh, plus you got a, a very lucrative uh, employment agreement in his sole focus after four months of transitioning the business was just to maintain that one client relation. So it can be done, but you definitely want to make sure that you structure you know the deal accordingly and, and I would start to get a little nervous once you hit that fifteen, you know, the fifteen percent. Uh capacity or utilization of equipment or you know, number of shifts. I mean again this is one that can somewhat cut both ways. The the higher the capacity, uh, the more the equipment is utilized probably the more profitable the company is going to be that you're looking to buy. The problem is of, is of why you're buying it or if you're looking to grow that business because if it's at 100% capacity and you want to grow it, you're going to have to add on plant and equipment and everything else which is going to be costly versus getting some of those synergies that you may otherwise get if, if uh, you know, you're buying something that's got maybe 50 or 60% capacity and it's still profitable. You can, obviously there's room to grow with the existing assets and, and, and dropping more money to the bottom you know, to the bottom line. You know, so again, if you're looking at a company, and we've seen, you know, call it a manufacturing company where they might try to, uh, you know, buy a company that's in the exact same space as theirs, making the same products with the same equipment. And if you if you are sitting with capacity uh, and it's and what they're doing in revenues is, is less than what your capacity is, you can move them right into your plant. You know, now you don't have that that plant expense, you don't have their employee expense, you don't have that additional utility expense and insurance and everything else. And basically what their gross profit was, you know, could put pretty close drop to your bottom line. So there's definitely some synergies uh, depending on how you, how you look at, uh, you know, capacity and things along that line. Uh, this is a big one, uh, is how did it perform in, in, in 2008 to 2012? What did the Great Recession do to their business? You know, what, were they off 40, 50 percent? Did they come back? Did they not come back? 
did, were they steady or did they grow? I've seen companies that grew right through the, the you know that recession, and I've seen others that you know just got killed by it. Uh, so you know, just because they they were down in sales doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. You just got to figure out how bad was it and did they come back or not, and then just understand that that company that you're buying is tied to you know the, the economic performance of the you know of the overall economy uh, in the United States and, and globally. What does the management team look like? Uh, you know, is the is the owner of the management team? You know, has he worked himself out of the business like we talked about? Uh, it really allowed the company to to run and grow without him or her in the business. Obviously, you want the second more than the first. What are the cost saving synergies? You know, if there aren't any, are you just buying this as a financial buyer, uh, or or are there the synergies that I talked about earlier where you can really look at the redundancies and and work out the cost, and, and again, one plus one hopefully equals three or four, not just two. Company culture, this is one that's overlooked a lot. Uh, you know, if it's extremely different than yours, even if the numbers look really good, you better have a heck of a plan of how you think you can change the culture in that, in that company, because I've seen, you know, this is probably the biggest reasons why deals don't, you know, one of the biggest reasons why deals don't uh, pan out the way that they think is people don't take into effect the culture here but if it's very close to yours, and if you know individually or as a company you share the same philosophies and management styles as the current owner does, you know it should make for a much easier transition. So briefly, some of the pitfalls. Uh, you know, I know when I'll see it. You know, whether you're a large company or an individual, this is one of the first things I hear a lot of times uh, when we're first talking to someone to help them on the buy side, grow through acquisition, or looking to buy a company, and. You know, a, a quick story that a gentleman had who had a high closing ratio of selling companies out on the East Coast for years, and I asked him how he had such a high closing ratio, and he said, you know, I screen the sellers really well to make sure we've got the right values, but I also screen the buyers, and I asked him how he did that, and he said that uh, he got so fed up with all these young guys coming in and saying he wanted to buy a business, and they just said, well, what do you want? Well, show me everything you got, and I'll try to find something out of there that, you know, makes sense for me. And he wasted so much time that he finally said, you know, hey, you know, go out to the airport, sit out there. When you see your wife uh, walking through the airport, uh, grab her, take her out of the chapel, get married, and then come back in, and uh, and then we'll uh, and then we'll talk about buying a business because that's really what you're looking for is that, you know, just like this woman is going to appear out of all the other women, some business is going to appear uh, out of all the others, and that's why we got the picture of the heavens opening up there, and you end up wasting, you know, end up wasting a lot of time and a lot of money if you don't have a set strategy. So you really want to set a strategy ahead of time before you ever go out and start contacting buyers. You know, and if you're an individual, you know, geographic area. You know, are you willing to move or not? You know, what's the geographic area that you want to have a commute for? What industries are you interested in? You know, what what can you afford? Definitely talk to a lender before you go out and start talking to people. And if you have a current lender, you know, you may want to talk to another lender just to make sure that you're keeping them honest. And also, some uh, you know, talk to an M&A advisor because some lenders are much more aggressive than others when it comes to uh, to lending on businesses. Again, from an individual standpoint, what are you good at? Taking skills and personality assessments, so objectively looking at it, like a Myers-Briggs or something like that, what are you passionate about? You know, if you can find a problem where, uh, that you're passionate about and then create a solution, that's that's a great way to find a business uh, versus trying to force a business into, uh, you know, something that nobody cares about. Uh, you know, if you're a company, what are your true true core competencies, you know, what is the number one reason why people are doing business, you know, with you, and it's usually not, you know, because you're really nice or you're ethical and things along that line, and, and then also, what's the one thing holding you back? You know, what's that one thing with that hourglass there that's squeezing, squeezing that uh, company that, if you could open that up, even a quarter inch would really help the company grow, and then either find, you know, at a high level, find a company that you can leverage your core competency, or find a company that does really well what you don't do well, and open up that uh, open up that funnel a little bit more. And, and that's you know just at a high level one area to take a look at of, of looking to grow. And then the second uh, common pitfall was the post integration plan. Most people don't have one. They spend all their time and energy and money on focusing on, on getting the deal done and making sure that all the numbers make sense. And then after the deal is done, they have the steak dinner, celebrate, and then move on to normal business. So to put a plan in place before you close the business and make sure that you make a good first impression uh, is absolutely important uh, that you do that with your plan because if not, again, this is this and culture 
are kind of the two silent killers why, why acquisitions don't uh, ever live up to or sometimes don't live up to the, uh, the numbers that are projected out. So with that, I think we're at, at our time. If there's any questions, uh, Ryan, otherwise I thank everyone. Uh, my information is here. If I can help you as an individual or a company, you know, buy a company or look to grow through acquisition or just answer any questions confidentially, I'd be happy to do that at any time. Scott, thank you so much for uh, the information that you shared. Uh, really do appreciate that. Um, and uh, I will uh, send out um, an email um, afterwards from this webinar with your contact information for those who have watched it uh, so, you can, uh, so you can do that. And contact Scott if you need that kind of help. So thank you again, Scott. Very much appreciated. Uh, next month, our webinar will feature Bill Prusso of Pros for Technology, who will explain how to protect your business data. And in January, just in time to save your New Year's resolution, Antonia Nelson of Green Bay Myofascial Release Therapy will present how to keep stress from eating you for breakfast, lunch, and supper. And then looking way ahead in March, uh, Susan Dutton uh, from Smart Relationships is going to talk about how to foster a culture of innovation and creativity uh, in your company. So again, you can register for these workshops and all of our upcoming webinars at uwgb.edu slash sbdc. We also have several past webinar recordings there on sales, marketing, business ownership, leadership, and professional development. Uh, including one that Scott did for us last October or November um, called How to Prepare Your Business for Sale. So in closing, I would very much like to thank Scott Bushke of Cornerstone Business Services. Thank you again, Scott. Thank you. Mickey Noon and Tim Bino at First Business Bank and Michael Wentworth of TMR Associates. And thank you all for attending. Now, go buy the right business. Have a great day. This concludes our webinar.